Now I want to throw up the next slide here. Let's throw up um, the next study. Yep, that's it. So on another, I call it a chemical, but even though it's found in food, and that's your, your sucralose. Now we're going to talk about sucralose is, you know, oftentimes... No, well, not oftentimes, is known under its trade name Splenda. Sucralose is chlorinated sugar. And so chlorinated sugar, there have been a the study here, this research study that I've got up on the screen for you is, is actually one where doctors actually had a case study of a woman whose hypothyroid was actually induced as a result of aggressive consumption of Splenda on a regular basis. So if you're, if you're a big fan of these artificial sweeteners, particularly Splenda, the chlorinated sugar version, one of the reasons why this is a problem is, is, is iodine. Iodine is also known as a halide. And halides are a, um, they're a grouping, if you ever studied chemistry in school and you remember the periodic table of elements, there's a grouping on the periodic table of elements called halides and that includes iodine and another compound called bromine and it also includes chlorine and it includes fluoride. So these are all considered halides, right? So halides are these four agents together. And so going back to this research study on Splenda and sucralose, chlorinated sugar, the chlorine, okay, as I mentioned here, chlorine is a halide. Understand that these three, bromine, chlorine, and fluoride, compete for uptake. So they compete with iodine to get into your thyroid gland. And so if you, if you have a diet or if you have um, an environment that's very rich in bromine, chlorine, and fluoride, then you can increase um, your risk of developing low thyroid by iodine inhibition. So in essence, you prevent iodine from properly being taken up by your thyroid because these three are competing with it. Now, sucralose or Splenda or chlorinated sugar, again, that's one of the reasons why it does that. Now, we can get chlorine too from drinking water, which goes back to what I said earlier, filter your water. If you're trying to avoid a thyroid problem, realize that chlorine is in your drinking water and for many cities, bromine is also in your drinking water. And guess what else is in your drinking water if you live uh, in the city and the water's being fluoridated, especially in the United States. Now, not so much in Europe, but in the US, and that's fluoride, the, the water is fluoridated. And some of you actually go out and take the effort to buy fluoridated water, in my opinion, which is a very, very bad idea. So you want to avoid overexposure to these things. Generally speaking, people get bromine when they eat bread-based products, when they eat flour. Flour, oftentimes your, your flours, your processed flours are brominated. It's a, bromine is a dough conditioner. So we can get overexposure to bromine through flour. You can get overexposure to bromine through pesticides. You can get overexposure to chlorine through drinking water, but also through pesticides. Same thing with fluoride. You can get it through drinking water. You can also get it through pesticide exposure. Fluoride is also found in toothpaste and mouthwash. It can also be found in tea and tea leaves. And that's you know green tea, black tea, or white teas. Not so much herbal teas, but um, green tea, black tea, or white tea. So fluoride is, a, is a commonly found, and I've seen, I've actually had people come in to see me where they were drinking, you know, five, six cups of tea a day, and the fluoride levels were through the roof, and they had hypothyroidism, and we had to get the tea out of their, out of their diet in order to really allow that iodine to get back into the thyroid. Now, from this perspective, I would say, what, what can we walk away from? We can walk away knowing that we can filter these things, but we can also walk away knowing that sucralose, which is an artificial sugar, which is designed as a calorie-free type of sweetener to prevent uh, blood sugar spikes and diabetes, which we actually know it doesn't do. It actually doesn't prevent blood sugar spikes or, or it doesn't improve overall blood sugar uh, regulation. So it's a bad idea to use it. It's an even more bad idea to use it if you have hypo hypothyroidism because again it competes with iodine uptake into that thyroid gland. So we've got, let me show you a picture of that here. Let's throw up the next slide here on, uh, on the sucralose itself. You can see this, what you're looking at in this slide is you're looking at um, on the top 
uh, versus the bottom, you're looking at sugar versus chlorinated sugar or sucralose. And so what you can see on that top in that molecule is a sucralose substitutes a chlorine, a couple of chlorine molecules for hydroxyl molecules, and that's what makes it different. It's supposed to create a scenario where you can't absorb uh, absorb the sugar, so then it becomes calorie free. But again, you can absorb those chlorines just fine into your body. They do go in. So if you look, let's pick up the next slide. I want to show you another one on this. So what you can see here again, I, I mentioned the halides, chlorine, bromine, and fluoride, and then iodine as well. So I think it's important that you that you kind of again understand where chlorine can play a role in that. So let's scroll down through these. Uh, I've got a few more for you. I, so, so again, we've got so far, we've got bisphenols, we've got perchlorates, we've got Splenda. Now let's talk a little bit about, okay, I've just told you to be careful of tea, and now most of you are probably going to start cussing me in your mind. Let's talk about coffee. Now, I want to be real careful when I say that um, coffee is not, necessar is not necessarily dangerous to everybody uh, who, has, who has an issue uh, with their thyroid. But there's some research studies that show a couple different things that I want you to understand. Number one, coffee reduces the uptake. So if you're on thyroid medication, it reduces the uptake of the thyroid meds. So if you're taking a medication, know that coffee can interfere with the effectiveness of your medication. Um, number two, coffee can mimic gluten. Now, in that regard, some people have a problem or an issue with coffee as a, because they're gluten sensitive. And so there's this molecular mimicry or this cross reactivity that can occur where in some instances for some people, coffee the elements or the proteins in coffee can actually look like gluten. And so for some people, remember that one of the causes of low thyroid is gluten. And so let's pull up that slide as well because I want you to see that. So coffee and gluten can look similar to, you know, to your body and so that can trigger a, a, a potential problem. But if you look here, so what we've got, in, there are a couple different studies I want to show you. And that number one, in this study here, you can see the presence of anti-gliadin antibodies in people with autoimmune thyroid disease. Where gluten's claim to fame is in terms of causing thyroid problems is in the autoimmune thyroid disease, so Hashimoto's. So gluten is known to contribute to Hashimoto's disease. A, a number of research studies that have shown those with gluten antibodies with Hashimoto's. And then we got another research study here for you that says that gluten consumption can elevate inflammatory antibodies for up to six months and that it doesn't take a whole lot of gluten consumption to do that. So if that's the first time you're ever hearing this, and I know you probably haven't been listening to me for very long, um, and maybe you haven't read No Grain, No Pain, but you know when, when I say No Grain, No Pain, I'm not just talking about physical pain in your joints or muscles. I'm talking about the, the pain of hormonal disease like thyroid, like a low thyroid, which causes fatigue and hair loss and weight gain and lethargy and depression, um, among other things. It can also cause muscle pain, and that's that hormonal pain, so to speak, where you have gluten-induced autoimmunity that can really, really wreak havoc overall in your body. So these are some of your predominant, we talked into a doctor and he says, hey, Mrs. Jones, you have low thyroid. There's two questions that you want to take this information. There's two questions you want to walk away asking. Number one, is my low thyroid autoimmune? So is it autoimmune? In essence, is it Hashimoto's? Okay. So ask that question. It's a very important de delineation because there's two predominant kinds of, of low thyroid and one of them is autoimmune. Okay, And all of these things that we're looking at here, except for sucralose, everything here has been shown to contribute to autoimmune thyroid disease, whereas sucralose has been shown to contribute to nutritionally low thyroid because iodine is a nutrient. So again, it's important that you ask, is my thyroid condition autoimmune? or nutritional. Now, I'll promise you this. If you ask your doctor if your thyroid condition is nutritional, he'll probably laugh at you and tell you that, that thyroid and nutrition have nothing to do with each other. 
And if that is the answer, then you definitely want to pick up your, your bag and walk out of the room and find another doctor as quickly as possible because they very, very much have everything to do with each other. I'm going to explain that next in part two of this breakdown, of this fundamental breakdown on thyroid for you. Hey, don't forget to check out the rest of the series right here. Make sure you hit subscribe below. And as always, thanks for tuning in.